Yo, 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 what's good? This is Craig Shapiro from the Craig Shapiro Tennis Podcast, and you are listening to the Brothers on Tennis. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? This is your boy, Isaac. And this is your boy, Bryce. And we are Brothers on Tennis. And guess what, folks? We've got a special guest today. We are doing (laughs) an interview, and I am very, very excited to talk to this brother. Bryce, I mean, we have we talked to Brother Glenn, and I'm telling you, this brother got knowledge, bro. He got straight up <laughs> knowledge. And I am so happy that our guests are going to be able to hear from him, hear his story, hear the things that he is involved with, because, man, it's some good stuff, bro. Right, it's right. It's good stuff. Well, you know, let's give our listeners a little background first. So yeah. um, how we became in touch with Mr. Gilliam is... Back in, I think it was 2015, September the 4th of 2015, PBS, as a part of their American Master Series, premiered a documentary simply entitled Althea. Right. And yes, it's that it's Althea. That Althea, <laughs> right, right, right. Althea so gets it twisted. And, um, you know, it was really an honor because this series on PBS is, is widely known for examining the lives the works, and the creative processes of outstanding American artists. So it was a big deal. I mean, I think over the past 34 years, they've garnered like 76 Emmy nominations. They've won like 28 of those. So it was definitely an honor to have the Althea documentary included in that series. Well, fast forward to today. (laughs) We have with us today Mr. Glenn Gilliam who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Althea Film Project and ACF Sports Premiums. He is also the producer and host of Real Dreams TV on YouTube and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. So Mr. Gilliam today is going to talk with us about some upcoming Althea milestones. And let's talk a little bit about some acknowledgments that she probably still don't, doesn't have really broadly known. Exactly. Um, also, we want to have a discussion about all these years after Althea, where there is still an opportunity in the world of tennis to improve on inclusion. Yes. In the game. Yes. So with that, we welcome Mr. Glenn Gilliam. Yeah. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I'm still recovering from the introduction. Uh, the check is in the mail. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that greatly. And let me just say right from the outset, because I don't want anyone to get it twisted. I owe all of my association, obviously, with the film um, to Rex Miller, the creator and filmmaker who uh, who put it all together and did a masterful job. I think it's his masterpiece. Uh, and I had a chance just to say briefly that uh, I had a chance to meet Rex when uh, when he won the uh, grand jury prize at the American Black Film Festival uh, back in 2015. So uh, all props to him and his creativity uh, and his content and the producers who are on the film as well. Uh, but thank you so much for a great introduction. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Glenn, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Althea and what... Sure. Little thing she may have done about 70 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I mean, yeah, great, great segue. I, I see why you guys are so, so special. Um, no, I mean, look, for, for lack of a better term, I probably overuse this, but I still call her story a hidden figure story. And um, as we all know, the, the great story about Katherine Johnson and the other incredible uh, black women who were at the forefront of advancements at NASA. Um, and, you know, that story fortunately got told and made by Margot Shutterly. Uh, but for that, we may not have heard about these extraordinary women. And once again, uh, my own uh, involvement with Althea actually came through a previous documentary done about the accomplishments of, of multicultural figures in golf. Because, as you guys well know, she, uh, she was uh, someone who had to leave the sport of tennis at the height of her powers uh, because she couldn't earn any money and ultimately taught herself, self-taught in golf, and then broke the color barrier at the LPGA in 1963. So, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, as, as far as, uh, um, you know, the initiatives and, and things that, that we're 
still trying to move forward on? That was the question, right? I'm sorry. I, did, I, I don't know if I was, was that the. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Let's okay. talk about what's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, yeah. This is, this, this is when you mentioned that 70 years ago, 1950. There's so many kind of great anniversaries happening this year. Um, but Althea's is, I think, uh, so important because she really was the female athlete of the 20th century. Um, you know, a lot of people like to always say she was the Jackie Robinson of tennis, and uh, she never appreciated that <laughs> herself, um, oh. from, from what I'm told, uh, you know. Uh, and that's always something, I think, a slight that women kind of have had to deal with, always being compared to potentially other men, um, when she really stood out on her own. But in 1950, uh, thanks in great part to uh, uh, the admonishment from uh, white U.S. champion Alice Marble, um, who wrote a, a very pointed uh, article um, in the tennis uh, uh, publication of the day saying, why hasn't this woman gotten an invitation to our national championship? If she has the skill and the talent, it shouldn't be her color that keeps her out. And lo and behold, the U.S. LTA at the time U.S. Lawn and Tennis Association, which preceded the USTA, um, made the invitation. And literally on her birthday, which is coming up on August 25th uh, in 1950, she broke the color barrier and played her first uh, set of tennis there, uh, what was at the Westside Tennis Club in Forest Hills. So wow. amazing, amazing anniversary. Yeah. yeah amazing. And, and I, I just want the listeners to, to know, I mean, we've both Isaac and I have both watched the documentary, an oh, amazing God. documentary. Actually, yeah. I think Isaac, we both said, you know, we were kind of in tears a little oh, bit at, at the end there. Um, Glenn, can you tell our listeners if they're interested in seeing this wonderful documentary, where and how can they view it? Yeah, um, well, it is still up on Vimeo, which is accessible, obviously, if you go to their website uh, under the Althea name brand. And it's available there for rent or for purchase. Um, we still have uh, the DVDs, which uh, I know uh, Rex uh, still has um, copies of that. And those are available uh, to be purchased as well. And that, we, you know, unfortunately, we had to take down our e-commerce site uh, last year. But uh, hopefully, we'll be getting that back up. But if you go to AltheaTheFilm.com, uh, you can reach Rex uh, through that and as well as myself. And, you know, I'll leave you my email address um, because I could also get you a DVD copy if you'd like. And the most important thing is that um, I'm still pursuing the screenings uh, because as an educational piece, uh, and, and just to mention, uh, we have a study guide actually that's appropriate for a grade school really, I think, through middle school uh, level students to give them kind of the, the most salient points that are, are remarked on throughout the movie um, and really the teachable moments. So the screenings are still available. Um, if you reach out to me at contact info that uh, hopefully the brothers can, can uh, provide, um, we're more than happy to, uh, to talk about doing a screening. And the best thing about it is, and I'll just, as a, as a plug in this world of diversity and inclusion, these are the stories that really amplify uh, the most positive results of inclusion. And that, uh, that couldn't be more, more important than obviously we see today in uh, the climate that we're dealing in. Um, it's, I think, something that, uh, uh, as a hidden figure story, something that so many people, in, in particular black women, who are having their moment uh, you know, of note uh, today um, which is well deserved and long overdue, uh, much like the the statue that was unveiled uh, last uh, last U.S. Open 2019 of Althea finally getting her permanent recognition uh, there at the USTA Tennis Center. So one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up is that you know I'm a person you know, that I kind of feel like I know a little bit about tennis. I know a little bit about the history of tennis. I, I, right. You know, I may not be the best, but I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe from to, with most people. Right. Watching the Althea documentary showed me right. just how little I knew about her overall story. Sure. Um, 
I want you to talk a little bit about maybe some other acknowledgments that she oh, has yeah. not yet received um, sure. as it relates to potentially the French Open, the Congressional yes. Gold Medal, the Presidential yes. Medal of Freeman. Right. Talk a little bit about some of those. No question. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, and I know, hopefully, I know you guys are, are planning on, on doing an actual review of the documentary. Uh, and uh, like I say, whatever I can contribute to that, I'd love to. But the documentary, I think, is so pivotal because Rex did a masterful job of including so much of the history, the broader history, obviously, of black tennis and the ATA in particular and her accomplishments there. But recognition, which came so late for the USTA, and I say so late in the sense that I think people have been clamoring for uh, and advocating for a long time uh, to see that recognition uh, at a place that, you know, it's her home country. This is uh, this should be uh, one of the first places that recognizes her. But the French Open, where she won her first Grand Slam in 1956, has yet to publicly honor her or recognize mm-hmm. her accomplishment. Okay. So, you know, that that's something that, uh, yeah, we're we're in, uh, you know, big time uh, uh, mode in pursuing that recognition. At the uh, at Wimbledon, which was considered for a long time and and probably still is for most people uh, the grandest of the Grand Slams, I believe she was the first to receive her award in 1957 from Queen Elizabeth herself, um, and she may be one of only a few that have that distinction. Uh, but you know, winning that Grand Slam was so important for a few reasons because she also won the doubles. Uh, uh, ultimately with Angela Buxton, who is a, uh, a British uh, citizen, but as a Jewish British citizen, she has also felt the, the, the stings of discrimination. And uh, I think without speaking out of turn, uh, Angela still has uh, um, some urgency about the, the lack of uh, acknowledgement um, on Wimbledon's part. So hopefully they will do something publicly. I'll give them credit. Um, because they have done some things online. Uh, I think Venus Williams did a great narration of a video that they ran, I believe, last year, um, which was, you know, timely and and important. And once again, one of the uh, principles within the film uh, went with Rex, Lenny Simpson, who has an incredible foundation, the One Love Foundation in Mm -hmm. Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, Lenny, Lenny, uh, says in the film, I believe that he got his first racket from Althea. So his connection to Dr. Eaton, where Althea lived and trained uh, in Wilmington, uh, is uh, unsurpassed in terms of you know him coming back to Wilmington ultimately and and really revitalizing that program uh, on Dr. Eaton's uh, uh, home court there. Um, so you know having the ability to to talk about this in the film is amazing. But Lenny actually took the step of taking the film uh, with Rex over to uh, the All England Lawn and Tennis Club and did a private showing for the members there. And that was amazing. Um, I wish I could have attended, but the bottom line is uh, it's just so important to share that story, which is part of Wimbledon history and should be something uh, that's embraced. So uh, kudos on that. And with any luck, there'll be something more publicly uh, on their own court during Wimbledon that uh, I think will be more than deserved. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, um, we're you know grateful for, uh, she just recently was inducted into the East Orange, New Jersey Hall of Fame <laughs> a couple of years ago, uh, which was amazing. Um, and uh, you might know she has a statue there also in Newark at courts uh, named after her. But uh, most importantly, uh, Billie Jean King acknowledged after receiving the first Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama for a female athlete um, that she said it should have been Althea first. Um, and and she, she's one of the big advocates, as well as an executive producer on the documentary, um, to say, hey, this was somebody who, obviously, what challenges she faced, Althea faced them, and then some. And uh, t- for the country club aspect of what Billie Jean King was able to at least survive and, and maintain a living, Althea didn't have those options. And, uh, you know, obviously we know everything that took place around, uh, well, not, I shouldn't say we know everything because if you haven't seen a film or if you haven't read her book, you might not know, but, uh, but it was really, um, 
serendipitous that Althea was actually able to stay on tour um, because uh, it was a, an, uh, I'm sorry, a option for her to think about going into the military. And, you know, thankfully, uh, she was convinced to stay on tour instead of doing that. She was supposed to interview for the military and sign up. And consequently, after discussing it with Angela Buxton and I think, you know, just her own sage advice, deciding that, hey, she could stay out on tour, she could win and continue uh, her climb and doing it at what would be considered a little more advanced age even. Because, uh, you know, she, she ended up winning uh, the, uh, the uh, first Grand Slam at the uh, uh, ripe old age of, I think, 26 or 27. Um, in 1956, right, she would have been uh, 26. So, you know, the bottom line is um, this is somebody who uh, deserves the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, also the Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, and actually there was uh, a hometown uh, New Jersey congressman who first brought that to, to light in 2014. Um, I think it's more than overdue, and I think uh, there'll be some galvanization uh, to, to get behind that. But we're not doing anything in terms of pre pursuing anything presidential until this person that's <laughs> occupying the, the White House right now is out of there. Uh, I, I felt sorry for Tiger Woods a little bit getting it from him, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, they got some business dealings going on. But no, it, you know, quite honestly, it's just something where it would have been nice if President Obama had made that, uh, made that uh, recognition. But, hey, you know, uh, he can't do it all. We understand that. And so right. hopefully uh, we get the right person in there in this next uh, upcoming go round. Uh, we'll pursue that. And, and hopefully that acknowledgement will be fast and coming. And I'll just say right up front, and I know you guys did a fantastic interview with former president and CEO Katrina Adams of the USTA. Um, she was obviously very determined and committed to getting that permanent recognition uh, there at the U.S. Tennis Center. And that wasn't easy, um, obviously. There had been uh, the One Love Foundation and their kids who had, uh, you know, made some overtures, uh, individual supporters like myself who, uh, you know, hopefully you know, could make a little noise, but, you know, there's so many fans of Althea. And the greatest part about it, and not to run on too long about uh, that particular piece, but the great part about Althea's story is, I think, as we talked about in our kind of pre-production conversation, she lifts all the boats because her success was able to highlight the, the real success and the importance of the ATA, obviously, which she was a, a big part of winning, I think, nine or ten championships in a row. And unbeknownst to a lot of folks, which is not expressed in the film, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Walter Johnson, um, Robert Walter Johnson, who is the godfather of black tennis and uh, mm -hmm. kudos yeah. to the Whirlwind Foundation and Land Johnson and the great work they've done to maintain and restore that legacy. Um, he played mixed doubles with her and won, I believe, six titles uh, at the ATA level. So. Uh, he wasn't just a coach and mentor and all of that. He was a player, of course. And uh, I had no idea. I found that out kind of late in my, uh, you know, advocation with Althea that they played together for several years. So um, just, you know, an amazing story. And then, of course, the, the story that you guys are well familiar with, with HBCU. She went to uh, FLAMU, Florida A&M University, <laughs> yes. uh, and left an incredible legacy there. I mean, you know. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a number of things we're pursuing, and I'll just mention, even though it wasn't something that I wanted to put out too early, but, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to apply for uh, her home uh, block in Harlem, New York, uh, to do a name change, a co-name change. Right. And um, I've been working with Don Felder, who is her second cousin and who's been absolutely, you know, just incredible in terms of preserving the legacy He's been providing most of the memorabilia and paraphernalia at museums, uh, especially the Smithsonian in D.C., uh, but other places in Wilmington, uh, as, as well as even uh, uh, other museums in New Jersey, what have you. Um, Don Felder uh, joined on the application to get West 143rd Street between 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue, uh, her home block named Althea Gibson Way. And we got the uh, approval for that. Um, about two months ago, and uh, we're really excited about oh, that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. being so able incredible. to celebrate that. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, 
it, you know, I, I don't, like I say, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to jump the gun. We're still waiting for a form, what should be a formality of approval by the city council. Needless to say, they have their hands full right now uh, amidst this pandemic. But uh, right. we expect that that will go through. And uh, and there's so many people. I mean, you know, uh, former Mayor Dinkins, who has been a, 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 a serious champion uh, uh, for Althea and for the game of tennis, of course, in New York, uh, who doesn't get enough credit for what he's done. Uh, that's another story that needs elevation uh, and recognition. But uh, Katrina Adams, once again, as the director there at the Harlem Armory, uh, was great enough to, to, to provide a support letter as well. Uh, Luke Jensen at the West Side Tennis Club, he's now coaching uh, in the WTT, but um, he provided a support letter, and they've been very supportive. We're, I'll just mention this as well as, a, as far as recognition. They wanted to celebrate this 70th anniversary by raising her championship banner, uh, which would have been coming up in a couple of weeks before the U.S. Open, uh, but hopefully we'll get a chance to do that in 2021. But uh, very exciting uh, opportunity still ahead, for sure. I mean, just, and Glenn, I tell you what, brother, this is <laughs> such incredible information, man. I, listeners, I, y'all, I hope y'all understand. This brother is talking <laughs> some serious knowledge. This is stuff that we really, really need to understand and appreciate. And the Althea Gibson story is just, to me, so underappreciated. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. brothers like Glenn that are just trying to get folks to be aware and to understand that path that specifically African Americans have had to have had to go through in order to get to this point. All folks think about right now really is, you know, they think about Venus and Serena and don't get me wrong. You know, we love our sisters. We love them with all of our heart, but there had to be those before them. Right. And this is the type of stuff. This is Althea Gibson. I mean, Glenn, just props to you just for all of the things that 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 you have done to this point, what you continue to do. I want to make sure that the listeners understand we're talking about the Althea documentary. You need to go out and check out that documentary. Yeah. Don't be playing around. Don't play around. <laughs> with Stop playing around. And well, let me do, way, no, we sorry. are going to have uh, Glenn as well as, I believe, we, did we say Rex? And, uh, and we're looking at potentially Leslie Allen uh, to come and actually talk about that. So we're not going to go into too much detail about the film itself because we want to save a little, a little specialness. <laughs> if you, that episode, um, but just just the fact that again the contributions with the film is just is so incredible, Glenn. And and, yeah. on, and and just really quickly, it's so funny that you brought up Lenny. We mm. ended up actually meeting Lenny last year at the U.S. Open 2019. Oh, fantastic! He right. was there yeah. with One Love Foundation, yeah. and we oh, got yeah. all just, the kids. Mm. Yeah, with all the kids and the, the nice yellow shirts, and we had the chance to talk with him. We were eating lunch and. Just had a wonderful conversation with him, and it was just, a thirty-minute history lesson from him. And got to, got to, <laughs> always, up. always. It was oh so awesome. So so again, not to not to kind of take over your interview here, but I mean, no, just please. so much good stuff and so much knowledge that that you possess, and we we greatly appreciate just again well, everything that you are doing in regards well, to yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, let me just say, I, and I, boy, you know, look, I, I'm trying to keep my head in this room. You guys are so. <laughs> So sweet and so uh, thoughtful, but I have to say, and I, I try to make a point of this, and you know, it's 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 something that I think, it's the thing that we're missing in a lot of ways. We're seeing Confederate statues come down, and finally Confederate flags, and all the all the Michigas that's finally taking place after so many unfortunate folks have had to sacrifice their lives uh, to get get really the support and galvanization around that. But let me just say, the important thing about this film. It's not, I mean, it's about Althea, of course, because it, it, she's such a touchstone there. But it is the folks, uh, I had uh, Dale Caldwell, who is the founder of the Black Tennis Hall of Fame. Uh, I think the person that you're going to have on for uh, part of the review with the documentary is one of the principals, Bob Davis, who's an icon within black tennis um, and has is, is been uh, working down in Florida diligently, uh, but he's also the president of the Black Tennis Hall of Fame, working with Dale, and they just hired, not just, but it's been a, a little over a year now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, hired a great executive director, Sheila Curry. And the Black Tennis Hall of Fame has been amazing at recognizing uh, these former champions as well as 
the people who the stuff the stuff of the of the of the industry the sport is really made of the coaches the contributors regionally um you know and like i say I, i'm not going to run through any shonda rubin was in that last class last year uh, mm -hmm. you know obviously a great talent thankfully that's that's on tennis channel uh but alice marble was slated to be finally recognized this year oh, which would nice. you know and i'm sure they'll do that at the first opportunity but um yeah, I mean, and that's always, you know, it's the balancing act always of, you know, having good intentions from white people who have the ability and the platform to say the things that shouldn't need to be said or that black people have been saying forever. But it's important that they make those statements. And she did. And she got uh, history uh, changed. But all of the folks I know Dale used to talk about Oral Washington and how incredible a champion she was and the Peters sisters who dominated and were amazing before Venus and Serena, of course, were, were to come to the fore some 50, 60 years later. But all of these, and I know you guys participated, thankfully, um, in the ATA's recent uh, virtual uh, conferences mm -hmm. that they had. And when the ladies got together, um, it was, I think, really spectacular because Leslie Allen uh, was, was forthright and, and deserving in making her admonishment of the USTA and their lack of real serious efforts in a lot of ways in terms of diversity and inclusion uh, and, and, and doing more because they have the resources and the wherewithal to do it, but more importantly, not trying to revise history uh, as so many like to do. Uh, and we can go on and on about stories <laughs> of support that really weren't there back in the day. Um, but, you know, uh, Zena Garrison and, and Kim Sands and Renee Blanc and uh, Ann Coger. I mean, the list of black women. Kyle, you have, yeah. Uh, Kyle yeah. Copeland, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't want to miss anybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, Art Carrington, who's uh, noted as, as the great historian of black tennis, and he has a new book, I believe, still coming out. Um, if you haven't gotten his first issue about black tennis history, you need to get it. Uh, Art Carrington up there in Massachusetts. I mean, there's, there's just a host of folks who continue to do great work. Uh, I know something we were going to talk about. Uh, I won't get into it too much, but uh, once again, the film undergirds the importance of the HBCUs and those coaches. And they had a, a seminar. They had a, a, a talk back as part of that ATA, USTA collaboration, which was really important. And I'll just touch on one quick thing in terms of uh, something that George Henry, who worked uh, closely with, with, um, with uh, Venus and Serena's dad, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, God, Mr. Richard Williams. Hello, <laughs> that's the man. <laughs> that's who the one, who, right? Who do, who still doesn't really get the praise and obviously credit he deserves? Uh, as really, I mean, if there's a Mount Rushmore of coaches, uh, he's got to be on there somewhere. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And that so that acknowledgement continues, and you know, we know that Will and Jada Smith. Uh, you know, a side of entanglements is are trying to get, <laughs> are trying to get, <laughs> trying to get that film made about Richard's life uh, called oh, King Richard. We wish them, right. you know, great success. Um, yes. I don't know, you know, it's 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 something that I think all of the and that's something I, you know. I know we didn't talk about this before, uh, at least in terms of uh, the need for more representation on air. But we also need this great because we know it's a celebrity driven culture. We need more of the celebrities who love tennis, who enjoy tennis, to step up and make a way and find a way to support the game even more than just sitting in Serena's box or, right. you know. Um, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, Boris Kojo's been great, of course. He's participated in a number of events. I mean, there have been a number of folks, uh, you know, just to say, you know, uh, Rex Miller has a new project that's going to be coming out on Arthur Ashe, and I don't want to say too much more about that, but... Uh, it's it's going to be amazing, I'm sure. But I know John Legend got involved uh, with that. So, you know, just having people take it upon themselves and say, hey, you know, I love the game. I'm so grateful that we've got this really incredible lineage. I mean, with, of course, Sloan and Naomi Osaka and Coco Goff and, and, and Madison Keys, uh, you know, all Sasha Vickery. I mean, Taylor Townsend, I mean, who I couldn't be more happy about her success at last year's Open. I mean, she's just um, uh, an unbelievable former junior number one who's really finding her groove, probably the best hands in tennis uh, in terms of doubles. So, 
you know, it's it's just uh, amazing that black women, thankfully, have been able to carve out such an incredible legacy and continue that arc from Althea and even prior to Althea to to now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, like I say, how long do we have? We got a couple of hours. What do we? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, we got, we got as long as you need. Bro. No, That's it's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Like no, a, like a producer said, he got his finger on the edit button. So. <laughs> well, look, hey, look, I, I, you guys, and I told you this, and I, like I say, I'm not going to try to fan out too much, but you guys have been the breath of fresh air, um, and it's been amazing. I kind of stumbled onto your presence. I'm so grateful for that. And I'll just say, I stumbled onto that looking for Shanda Rubin and Zena Garrison's a live stream of Game Set Chat. What they're doing is amazing uh, yeah. as well. So having these, you know, dual forces, and not to malign or, or not to belittle any of the other great writers at The Undefeated and, and other places, Bill Roden, who's been doing, obviously, immense work and who was a big supporter, obviously, of the documentary. I mean, there's, there's just so many folks who, who've been taking up the, the challenge to, to put this history and put this game in perspective because there's been a lack of on-air uh, in front of the camera talent to talk about all the important things that really revolve around the history and why they're still, I mean, the sad part is no one really talks about it anymore, but before Colin Kaepernick, and granted it was a different type of protest, right. but Venus and Serena didn't play Indian Wells for right. 15 years. Right. Um, that's been so underreported. So, and look, I'm sure for their part, they'd much rather not focus on that of mm -hmm. course, but people have to understand in their own home country, they were being treated poorly and discriminated against uh, to the extent that they forego the opportunity to not only win titles and money, but paid a penalty for not playing in that tournament for 14 and 15 years. That's an incredible, uh, you know, uh, commitment to the integrity and, and the support of their father as well as uh, their own uh, place in the game. And I think that that's something that still needs to be fleshed out. And I would just encourage anyone at Indian Wells and BNP Paribas uh, to make a public overture of apology. That's just me. I'm nobody, but I'm just saying it would be helpful in terms of reconciliation. Those girls went back to the tournament, you know, just because they felt it was time, I believe, uh, and the game is much better for it, of course. So. Right. And I tell you what, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I remember in our interview with Zena Garrison, mm -hmm. uh, she stated while she was on tour, she always felt like she was treated better abroad right. than she was Hello. here Hello. In, yep. the, in the U.S. And yep. that's probably a common sentiment with the African-American players. Yeah, absolutely. Which I'm is sad. Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is on tape. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> you, you you see Serena enjoy so much fame and fortune, well, fortune, but fame and notoriety in other venues. Um, the love that she has for the Australian, uh, her love of the French Open and the people of France and all of that. And yet for the, 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 the few incidences that are, always, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> subtly reminded yes. to us yep. about, you know, oh, yes, that, that open semifinal or quarterfinal with Kleisters or whatever. And, right. and you know, and then, the, the, you know, the breakdown, which was, just my opinion, totally the umpire's fault uh, in the uh, U.S. Open at Naomi Osaka one. Um, you know, I think it's been something where it's really strange that, you know, the kerfuffles that have happened have all been, you know, Indian Wells included, have all been here on our home turf. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very unfortunate, I think, uh, little bit of history with that. But, you know, th these things uh, are, um, are things that can be reconciled. And I think uh, more importantly, and, you know, I don't know what the, the protocol is in terms of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, but they should recognize Richard Williams, hopefully while he's still with us yes. and still in good shape. Um, yeah, I mean, I just... You know, those things, and like I say, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just trying to put what no, I think is no. important out there. Yeah. And, and you know what? And if, you know, for anybody that listens to our show, oh, yeah. they know that that is a drum that we beat. We no feel doubt. like 
Richard Williams does not nearly get the credit yep. for what he has done. He has done something that has not happened in the history yep. of, of tennis, of and tennis. he did it his way. Yep. He predicted he was going to do okay. it. You know, and that may, that may have been the problem. Been yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, it, was, that was part of the problem, that he predicted it and it came true. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it absolutely came true. And right. I've said many, many times, and I don't, you know, I'm not trying to play a race card or anything here, but no, sure. if, if Richard Williams had been a white man, Mm-hmm. We would have a line of tennis balls called <laughs> R.W. Yes. There would be no more Penn. Yes. There would be no Look. more Wilson. There would be R.W. balls. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, yeah, if he had been a white man, Orsi would have some explaining to do because it's like, <laughs> What? No, but I, I, I wanted to interject her name because Oracine deserves so much yes. credit as well. Um, no discount, obviously, to what Richard created and labored uh, to, to put in those girls and build. But Oracine, I mean, the, 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 the mileage that this woman logged, the kind of yes. uh, values that she instilled in those girls, uh, the rest of the, the other sisters, I mean, that's such a beautiful family. And, and what they've They've really just held the mantle up so beautifully over the years. Um, you can't say enough about that. And it's, it's just beautiful to see the likes of Sloane Stevens and Coco Goff and their families. And just all of the, the, the real folks around the game, Donald Young and his family. Um, you know, you see Kamal Murray and, and the work he does with Sloan. Uh, and he's got an academy. Zena, of course, her academy. John Wilkerson, who doesn't get enough praise, uh, right. you know, who, who brought Zena. And, uh, and Lori McNeil along. I mean, you know, there, there's so many folks. I mean, uh, you can go to the Black Tennis uh, Hall of Fame website, Black Tennis Sports. Uh, Sheila Curry and, and, and Bob and, and those folks have laid out the, the great history, so you can find a lot of good information there. Um, but thank you guys for creating a platform that, you know, this kind of stuff can be talked about, as Roland Martin would say, unfiltered. You know, it's, uh, it's a really important thing. So, so, Brother Glenn, a question for you. So, sure. for our listeners, you know, some of them may be, may be a little bit new. What would be your advice as far as, you know, learning more about the ATA, learning more about, you know, the Black Tennis Hall of Fame? I mean, you, you mentioned their websites, but is there right. something else that you would, you would recommend in regards to some of our newer folk who just simply don't know that history, because again, it's, it wasn't like it's it been ever present. It's always been, just been more or less, you know, kind of Venus Serena for, for the new folks. And right, they don't, sure. and that's why for us in our platform, we're trying to open it up so that people understand you did have a Chanda, you did have a Zena Garrison, you had a Katrina Adams, you had an Althea Gibson, you had all of these wonderful, great sisters that people may not know about. And again, it's tied to that ATA history and a lot of that, you know, uh, that the Hall of Fame. So I just kind of wanted to ask you that. What would sort of be sure. your advice to our listeners who who want to get more information and who need to get more yeah. information? No, I mean, look, it, you know, the, the great thing is we've all got computers at our, our fingertips with these phones. And thank God we have cameras in the phones for other reasons. Um, yes, but, yes, Lord. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, look, uh, thankfully the ATA has got a, you know, this is their 116th anniversary. Uh, 114th, excuse me. Uh, anna- no, 104th. My bad. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm Corona. I'm corona out. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, they were founded in 1916 before the Negro Leagues who, as I, I think I mentioned to you guys before, this is their 100th anniversary in 1920. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's plenty of history to be discussed and, 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 and elevated there. But uh, thankfully, Black Tennis uh, Hall of Fame, blacktennispros.com, uh, they're both on the web. And it's great to see those things. And more importantly, if you have the opportunity, obviously, to attend and be, obviously, in participation with, uh, go to... Uh, the Black Tennis Hall of Fame induction series uh, when it takes place. Go to the ATA uh, National, which is, you know, that's something that they're trying to uh, revitalize in terms of making the ATA national again in terms of having tournaments, having, uh, giving more access to young kids of of color, black kids in particular, of course, uh, around the country, you know, trying to to fight for... uh, giving that that really common 
uh, local access. And, and what I was mentioning before with those HBCU coaches, uh, George Henry, Wayne Crutchfield, uh, uh, both at HBCUs, George at FAMU, uh, not, excuse me, back it up, sorry, George, at, <laughs> at Bethune-Cookman, <laughs> at Bethune, uh, just, just installed there at Bethune-Cookman doing great work, and, uh, and uh, Coach Crutch uh, at NCA&T. Um, you know, they're, they're, they've put together a little kind of manifesto proposal of sorts of how to get not just back to exposing, it's not just about exposing young kids uh, in the way that Richard Williams uh, did with his daughters at ages four and five years old, really taking an interest to get them into the sport, but able to recognize the kind of athletic talent that could be, if worked on, if the groundwork is laid, could be elevated so that we could finally see another American black champion on the male side. Um, You know, there's been so many programs. Look, the NJTL does admirable work. I don't want to say anything. That was what Arthur founded in 1969 uh, with um, my man. uh, And I'm going to forget his name right now. It's terrible. Um, But the uh, Spanish gentleman, uh, Passerell if I'm not mistaken, Charlie Uh, Charlie Passerell, back in 1969. That is a great program. It has, obviously, a lot of virtues. The unfortunate thing is it's more about introductions to the game, all of the important um, takeaways of teamwork and and, and, and sportsmanship and all of that. It's not necessarily, it's not really set up for any kind of high-performance play or to develop those particular talents. So the desire to get back to a community-based kind of uh, venue or organization that the network can be created so that you can get the kids there that really want to grind and the parents who understand they need to bring it to that level if they want to see their kids be able to elevate their games, hopefully to Division I scholarship or HBCU scholarship, Hello, um, yeah. and, and 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 potentially beyond that to actually be uh, successful on a professional level because that's really uh, what what's important. I mean, I don't want to say that's the only thing important. HBCUs still crank out all of these incredible professionals from you know medical to banking to law- lawyers and, and everything else. So we don't want to you know malign uh, the kids that end up being such productive citizens and love the game of tennis. But getting these champions um, and, and being able to cultivate that, that talent from an early age is really what they're trying to do. And I hope to help them with that as well in some small way. But, um, yeah, just so much work still to be done. But, you know, we've got a great legacy and it needs to be shared. Right. A question that I had was I know mm-hmm. that, you know, historically the ATA championships the winners of those tournaments right. used to get a berth into the U.S. Open. Uh, well, initially it was the qualities, and then it changed to the main draw. I, you know, I, Zena Garrison mentioned in her interview with us that right. we gave that up at some point. Do Are you aware if anyone is trying to revitalize that and bring that back? Because I, I hate that we ever gave that up. Right. In the first place, and I, I'm not familiar with the circumstances around why that happened. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, look, I, I, I would not even attempt to, to lie about knowing all the intricacies uh, with that, especially in terms of timetable. But that has been discussed routinely, um, needless to say, uh, when I've attended the ATA, which, let me just say, I had heard about the ATA before I got involved with, with Rex and the film. Um, but because of the film, I obviously got a completely uh, uh, ground level uh, understanding of how important the ATA was, of course, and the fact that it, it preceded everything in the sense of they didn't have a playbook to work with. They had to create out of whole cloth. And I'll just I'll just say that birth, that potential birth, you know, whether it goes into qualies, uh, however it, it might be determined, I think is something that could be restored, even though, as we all know, Unfortunately, of course, we, we lost a lot of the great players in all sports when integration came along, of course. And, you know, they had a chance to go to Division One schools that had, you know, the top level facilities and in, in a lot of cases playing a lot of the top level talent. So um, 
But, you know, we're seeing, you know, uh, the likes of some of these five-star basketball players going to Howard University. Right. Um, yeah. Folks finally recognizing that there is not only just viability and importance, that experience, look, I didn't go to an HBCU. I know in my heart I would have really considered, if I had more knowledge myself of HBCUs when I was, uh, you know, in that, in that time of my life, um, I might have been a little bit more uh, leaning that way. I know now if I could redo it, I would, I would be very hard-pressed not to go. Uh, I know all of my friends who attended, um, the networking, the friendships, the allegiance and ties to the school. And I'm not taking anything away from my alma mater. I love those folks. Um, <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't want anybody to get upset. No Twitter right. people. You know, one, of my, <laughs> one of my closest friends, a couple of my closest friends are on the council there, a recent former president. T, don't write me. I, I love Dartmouth. It's all good. Uh, but yeah, no, <laughs> it's just that uh, there is a afterlife which really, um, you know, extends, I think, in so, so great a fashion because of those experiences on the campus. Uh, but yeah, to, to, you know, your, your point, it's just, uh, we, we really need to investigate, is there a way, and maybe, you know, because the ATA National is in a kind of a rebuilding situation, I mean, in the sense that, uh, can we get the necessary talent there to really, uh, afford someone to get into the qualities. I think it could be done. It probably would have to be in concert with some of the HBCU championships. Um, and at that point, you know, uh, you know, you guys well know, uh, it ain't just black people at HBCUs anymore. Right. right, right. <laughs> We've got Shame. a lot of, yeah, out of town talent. Uh, well, I the, believe, uh, um, yeah. I think, was it Kim Sands who mentioned during sure. that discussion mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago that Michael Chang mm -hmm. won yeah. the ATAs and got a berth <laughs> into <laughs> the U.S. Open. So, yeah, we, we definitely know it wasn't just black folks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what's all this reverse discrimination stuff, okay? We, we've, see, we've seen how white people get down in terms of getting their kids into school, okay? Um, you know, most people, a lot of people would be surprised to know there are two HBCUs that are predominantly white. And that's, you know, that's a mind blower. Uh, and it's, you know, it's something where, um, and look, Nothing against anybody who's able to take advantage of the great education you get at these schools. But there is a point where we have to redouble our efforts to make sure as many black kids are getting the opportunity and getting the access. And on the sports side, if we just have a few five-star talents come back to the HBCUs on an annual basis, it would raise the boats fundraising-wise on so many different levels, um, you know, enrollment, of course. I mean, it just would be such a huge, huge gift if we could make sure that these kids are informed. And I'll just say this, uh, uh, you know, un unprovoked promotion, Black College Expo, which does an amazing job. Uh, Dr. Paris Teresa Price in California, uh, my boy James Gilmer, who's on their board and has been working with them for years. She's been around for 25 years exposing the black college uh, opportunity, HBCU opportunity, to kids in markets that don't have it readily available. So she's in LA and they have, I think, 12 markets that they go to. Uh, and they've been instrumental in recently, in the last three, four years, bringing the college combine uh, opportunity to their expos in terms of doing a combine for football and basketball. And we've talked about hopefully finding a way to bring tennis because they want to touch all sports. Um, and they're getting scholarships for these kids out of high school for basketball and football. And, you know, we've even seen, uh, thankfully, some of these uh, HBCU uh, NFL, uh, HBCU football players go to the NFL uh, more and more. So it's, you know, uh, everything's on the table. And, and the key thing, I think the ladies spoke about it, I think it's been said throughout that week, have to make big demands. You know, we can't ask for incremental small things around the edges. The USTA has a lot of, obviously, power, a lot of resources. Uh, we need to press them to bring as much to the table as, as necessary. Um, and then we've got to, you know, find ways to, to fundraise and strategize 
and do what's necessary to, to bring tennis back to the community level in, in a way that um, I think would make uh, a lot more uh, possible the opportunity to see uh, men and women, black uh, young boys and girls, have the chance to advance, enjoy the game of tennis, but possibly get on to you know, the, the professional level and, and really uh, you know, extend the legacy. So lots to do. Lots yeah, no, do. and 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 you know, coming from you know, brothers on tennis, we are HBU heavy. We got right. our producer Chester, who's FAMU representing. Exactly. We got brother Bryce <laughs> representing Southern University. I Fantastic. am representing Grambling State. So there's all kinds of love for the HBCU. So you're amazing. absolutely amazing. right, uh, brother Glenn. We've <laughs> got to make sure that we are doing what we can to not only give them that visibility and exposure, but really get that game of tennis pushed pushed down to 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 that level. And I mean, and, and, and Glenn, one thing that I kind of wanted to, to talk to you about a little bit and just kind of transitioning a little bit is just talking about, you know, the 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 sport of tennis, talking about diversity, HBCUs. We're also talking about, you know, kind of really, truly the lack of diversity mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, the, the commentating, when it comes to the media. Again, that's one of our emphasis for, for putting this podcast for sure. together yeah. is to give, you know, give folks of color an opportunity to get some shine. And so, <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, no. so I wanted to hear from you just in regards to your sure. experiences from not only just a media standpoint, but what you've seen and where you think, you, you know, change really needs to be made. Well, I mean, if, you know, yeah, how much time? Okay. So, <laughs> no, it, 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 all of these topics could be their own, and and that's the thing. I mean, between what you guys are doing and what games that Chad is doing, and yep. and you know, like I said, the undefeated and everybody who's contributing to this conversation, uh, it's just critical. And it's unfortunate that you know, like I say, these tragedies have you know finally yielded a focus where people are saying, okay, yeah, time's up, which was created by a black woman 20 years ago. It wasn't, you know, these Hollywood celebrities, um, you know, who say, you know, uh, yeah, believe her when she tells her story. Well, black folks have been saying for 400 years, um, believe us when we tell you our stories of discrimination or slights or inhumanities and all of that. And within media, I mean, to me, uh, I've said it many times uh, in different contexts, the media is going to be, unfortunately, they have so much power, I think they will be uh, part of the destruction of this democracy if we don't reel them in. Because um, the stories, the narratives that are put out on the media, and it extends, obviously, from politics to sports to anything else, education, what have you, is really important. Those visual images uh, that people get, if they don't see representation, if we don't hear the real true story, um, from people who know and have the insight to speak on it, uh, things are lost. I, I, I'll i just say quickly, I get so tired in all spaces, not just tennis, but tennis is one of them, where the on-air talent doesn't know who the camera is focused on. There may be a black person of prominence in the audience. They have no idea who it is. They don't speak on, they don't speak on it. I'll, I'll give a perfect example. And this is you know no celebrity, so it's, it's no slight in that respect. But they were showing the start of a tournament in England, in Great Britain. And I'll just say, Ted Robinson and Tracy Austin were on the call and the guys took a knee. Everybody, the referee, the players, even I think the, the, uh, the, refer uh, the other judges, everybody took a knee on the court. They said they held that shot for at least 20 seconds and they said nothing about it and went right to who's playing and what have you. And I think that's unfair yes. because you have to acknowledge in real time what's going on. Yep, there have right. been millions that's of right. people protesting in England. They're taking it seriously. Millions of folks protesting in France, obviously taking their lead from America. How can you sit there and watch that knowing how controversial the knee taking was with Colin Kaepernick and knowing where we're at with, you know, uh, obviously Black Lives Matter, not to at least have something to say about that acknowledgement, and they said nothing. And look, I know I've met Tracy several times. I think she's a great on-air personality. I have my issues with Ted, but that's another story. Anyway. But no, no, we're not going to make that another story, because I want to bring in, 
my Ted Robinson yes. story. <laughs> and, and, and he was actually with Tracy Austin oh, in yes. that situation That's as well. Right. Sure. And they were talking about Sophia Kennedy. Yep. Okay. And they, and they were mentioning that what a great job her father had oh, done. Oh, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> coaching her. <laughs> right, right. He had no tennis background. <laughs> and he said he struggled. <laughs> he said he struggled <laughs> to come up with another example of a father that did not have a tennis background <laughs> that has such success. And he said the only person he could think of, maybe, <laughs> was, he, was it Bartoli? Yeah, it was Marion Bartoli. <laughs> <laughs> and so hey, I'm what? sitting here in my living room screaming, screaming. Richard Williams. Oh my and, god! And, and at least Tracy came back and said, "Well, what about Richard Williams?" <laughs> you know, you know? I mean, he's a seasoned veteran as a commentator, and you could not even think of Richard Williams in that scenario. Hey, cue, cue the Jeopardy music, okay? Cue the, uh, <laughs> the final Jeopardy answer. I mean, it's just. It's just, look, one of the, my favorite <laughs> remembrances of last year's Wimbledon, and they do it every year, apparently. I don't know if this was the first time they actually aired the, the visual on, on camera, but ESPN is over covering Wimbledon. And I guess it was one of the, uh, there's one of the celebrations they have is an all white day. And that couldn't have been more, <laughs> more uh, prophetic. They have an all white day where everybody wears white. I mean, obviously, that's what they have to wear on the courts. But right. the whole ESPN crew took this group picture. Everybody's in white. Everybody is white. And I'm like, <laughs> is, that, is, is that a statement of, I mean, look, and no discount to Mary Jo Fernandez. I know she's Latina. I appreciate her, um, you know, from a distance, though. Uh, anyway, right. but, <laughs> but, I mean, and look, and, and while we're on this topic, uh, and I've been, you know, I mean, look, anybody who's listened to me rant about you know, the, the media exclusion uh, or, you know, the, the dearth within the sport um, knows that, you know, I've had my issues with the lack of on-air talent. I don't know what happened between ESPN and LZ Granderson. Uh, I, I've heard LZ do some commentary. I thought he did a great job uh, covering world team tennis, I think, for CBS at the time. Um, he's knowledgeable. He knows the game. There's plenty of folks who do. I think it's unfortunate that it took them to last year's U.S. Open to bring Alexandra Stevenson on the set. And, right. and she had to fight to get her words in. Um, right, right. And I actually saw recently, you know, some of the back and forth on, I guess, Twitter or, you know, uh, from, the, from the cheap seats trying to almost disqualify her ability to speak on things. And even, I mean, I don't know, for some reason, roasting her for still wanting to play. I mean, she's only 38 years old. Um, obviously, you know, I guess, you know, Martina Navratilova, I don't know when, when she stopped playing, and no discount to her. I'm glad she played as long as she did. But right. 38, at this point, we know people are still playing at that age. If right. you still have the dream and the desire, God bless her. But she brought some relevance to the conversation because all the old heads they have sitting around, the usual suspects, mm -hmm. no need to name them, we all know who they are, They've, they never played against many of these players. They have no idea of who, who these players are on the court. Right. She's right. at least played against many of the power hitters because it's a power hitting game for the most part. But, you know, uh, I thought she brought uh, relevance to the conversation. And, you know, it's unfortunate, though, once again, because at a distance, you would not know a person of color is actually on, on set. Nothing against Alexandra. That's not her fault. But, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, they couldn't find anybody lighter to be on stage, but I'm glad they brought her <laughs> on because no, I mean, I, I say, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not trying to make a joke out of it at all right, because it's right. very serious. And right. it was in, it was an important inclusion that needs to be followed up with more substantive hires. And once again, like your, your, your Chester uh, Jones as a producer, they need to have people on the production side who right. have the ab ability to make those choices. Those right. are things that's, you know, one of the immediate things, but um, yeah, there's just too much talent out there. I mean, uh, there's a number of people who are camera ready uh, who could be commenting on the game uh, and uh, or and or in the production uh, units. And uh, look, I mean, we know Katrina's vast abilities. Uh, we know Leslie Allen is is a, is a capable speaker. I mean, we know so much. I mean, you know, I, I'm not 
trying to just throw names out there for the hell of it. But there are plenty of folks who could be in the mix on if they have the desire to do it. I mean, you have to right. want to do it. That's right. for sure. Um, but yeah, there, there just needs to be a concerted effort. It can't be the Rooney rule. It can't be, you know, we can't right. just have folks voluntarily saying, oh yeah, well, you know, we'll take this token in the interview, but we have no real interest in hiring. There's got to be something more concrete that can be done. And uh, from the coaching standpoint, we know there's a dearth of coach. There's a, a number of coaches that could be uh, considered that could speak on the game intelligently and talk about these young champions that are coming along. Um, and, and, you know, the prospects of the ones uh, not far behind. So, um, yeah, so much that is required there. And look, I, I think, you know, <laughs> John McEnroe, I have a, uh, um, you know, a bittersweet relationship with him in terms of, <laughs> you know, I mean, as the old term says, a, a broke clock is right twice a day. I mean, at some point, <laughs> he's, he's going to say something correct. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was one of the advocates about Althea's recognition, and I applaud him for that. I think he's been a little over his skis talking about wanting to play Serena. Uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, I don't know if he's trying to hype a book or what. I don't know. But anyway, um, but but no, but I mean, I think his his heart's in the right place. And in most cases, but, you know, to 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 have been the player and the the, the annoyance that he was while he was playing and not to be right. more empathetic to the struggles that some have had in particular um, on the court, whether it's Nick Curios, who I consider black. Um, <laughs> or, or the stuff that Serena's had to deal with. I, I think, you know, you, you need another voice in there that can bring perspective. And I think that's, uh, that's important. Well, before we wrap this up, because yeah. I tell you, this has probably been one of our best oh episodes ever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's at the I, top for me, guys. <laughs> I have, a, I have a, a, an honest question, and, and because I really don't know the answer to this, I'm just wondering if you have any insight. Sure. Are you aware of any black coaches that have been on tour that coached a player that wasn't black? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, man. OK. No, I mean, well, look, and, 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 and therein lies, you know, we yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the issue. Where do these young talents end up going after they've been raised up to a level where, you know, here we are, we, we've got, and, and look, um, I hope that they continue to let uh, Martin Blackman do what he's doing at the USTA uh, and acknowledging that, the, you know, the high performance talent. Um, but no, we, we, there's other factors that need to be uh, focused on the black coaches who are cultivating talent, but then get kind of shunned aside when you know the next level is approached, um, and I, I think if that's where you're you're going with it, um, but that's you know, uh, am I on the right track? Would you? Would you yeah, absolutely. Okay. Even yeah, I mean, though, sorry, even sorry. though I must correct myself, I just no. somebody just popped in my mind. Come on, Murray. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. For a few minutes. With no, Monica Puig. Right, right. Uh, oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, do we have time to unpack that? No. I mean, <laughs> look, Kamal look, has done a masterful job of building what he's built mm -hmm. and creating the space and, 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 you know, working with the talents of Taylor Townsend and Sloan Stevens. And then for that, for that cup of coffee with Monica Puig, I mean, yeah, it, it was a misstep. I'm sure he would have. He would have liked to, you know, retrace his steps and, and probably right. handle that differently. Right. Um, uh, I have a, a very light tangential relationship. I mean, I, I love Kamau. I try to support him uh, as much as I can with what he and Sloan are doing and obviously what he and his academy are doing. Uh, and we need more of that. I mean, right. uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, aside, you know, from that little bit of slip with with uh, Monica, but that's the thing, though. You you know when you got these talents, Francis Tiafo. I know you guys love FA two Felix uh, uh, mm -hmm. Alias. Right. Um, when when you've got those talents, who fortunately had parents who were able to introduce them to the game, uh, you've got to find a way. And and Coco's been in a, a perfect situation with obviously her parents and their mm -hmm. sports background and 
you know, ultimately connecting. Patrick Mar- Maradagalu is is just, you know, he's just loving black folk. I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's, just, he's, he's, he's making so much coin, I swear. Uh, yeah. You know, his, yeah. Uh, I mean, his coffers were filled anyway. But anyway, I love you, Patrick. No, no disrespect to Patrick, uh, even right. though I think you bailed on my girl in that final. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> got a little, got a little, got a little handsy there, you know. Just, uh, but no, but I, I think that's that's something that you know, and I think you know, I think the what the ATA did in terms of putting those HBCU coaches uh, on on the record and having that conversation, so much more uh, needs to be done. I know uh, what was you know being pursued by folks who were in the DNI division at at. At USCA, and that's curious. Uh, Isu Mayat, who was uh, involved with managing the relationships with the ATA and the HBCUs, I believe to uh, to a, a degree. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer inside the USTA, but he's doing coaching now. If I'm not mistaken, he was on those calls, moderating, and doing a great job there. Um, D. A. Abrams left the business. Uh, he's on to bigger and better things, but. That DNI uh, program needs to touch on more pieces of um, the game. Uh, they do a great job, Donna Dozier Gordon, folks who are still there holding that down, but there needs to be a broader uh, responsibility in terms of how they reach out and how they can affect some change uh, because they they have you know they have the golden goose. I mean they they make 380 to 400 million dollars, I think a year at the U.S. Open, um, they're not hurting. The USTA Foundation isn't hurting, and they've been riding, you know, they've been riding coattails for a minute, making, you know, making a lot of bank. I look, I, I, I've got no friends, unfortunately. <laughs> I have less friends now, unfortunately, <laughs> over there. No, I mean, look, I, you know, I, I, I just try to call it as I see it. And, right. and, and any, in every effort right now, is important because uh, it doesn't make it not that it doesn't make a difference the fact that you may have dropped the ball up until now but right now you have an opportunity to do some really powerful things and I think I think they could be um, you know if we make the demands if we actually put forth a collective uh, agenda to say hey these things need to be addressed and seriously the leverage they have with the media whether it's tennis channel or, or, or ESPN uh, is tremendous. So to, to, to make the statement that we'd like to see more representation, I think is a fair one. So, I mean, we can't put it all on them. Of course, we have to galvanize our own voices and make sure that we're standing shoulder to shoulder to say, hey, this needs to change. And, and so hopefully the coaching situation, on-air talent, production talent, uh, all these things are they're in the wheelhouse right now. Who knows when Corona is going to be lifted? We need to strategize and, and keep putting these platforms out front to talk about it. Right. Well, well, I tell you what, on behalf of Brothers on Tennis, we appreciate. <laughs> no, seriously, we appreciate the voice that you have had. Yes. We need more people like you to speak out. The more people we have aboard this this ship, uh the less it becomes a Herculean effort for sure. the few, right? Exactly. So we we thank you for even taking time to come on and speak Ooh. with us today. This has been not only an insightful interview for, for Isaac and myself, but we know the listeners are going to get a whole lot out of this. And I tell you what, we can't wait for you to return and for you to bring <laughs> your posse to talk about <laughs> the Althea documentary because that really is a wonderful piece of art. Yes, no, yes, it that, is. That's going to be amazing, guys. I can't tell you. Look, you're going to be making a lot of enemies out there, <laughs> get, get, lavishing me with this praise because you know I I've been a thorn in a few people's sides, but it's okay. You know what? Uh, I, I'd like to think. I'd like to think. And with all due respect, I know we talked about this before. Uh, much props and rest in peace to Robert Raylan. Yeah. Um, in, in terms yeah. of his recent past, I know you guys have already spoken on that and gave your respects, which was great, um, of course. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where uh, John Lewis, who I had so much respect for, uh, Pastor C.T. Vivian, all these incredible giants who have passed. I'd like to think I, I, I've made a little good trouble. And, you know, <laughs> that's 
That's about yeah. as much as I can hope uh, to, to offer at this point. Yeah. No. Thank you guys so much. No, thank you, Brother Glenn. It has just been an awesome, awesome time. Thank you so much for, for just chatting it up with us, man. Right. No doubt. No doubt. So to our <laughs> listeners, keep an eye out for the Althea documentary review yeah. that hopefully will get done sometime in, in this next month. So well, her um, birthday's you know her birthday's coming up on the twenty fifth. So let's, let's 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 make sure we're getting it in around that time frame. Absolutely, which is also a day before our one year anniversary. So there'll be a whole. Oh, are you serious? Okay, we're on the twenty sixth, so we'll always remember uh, that date for our (laughs) thing. So, so with that, to our listeners, uh, thank you for listening. And this has been your boy Bryce, and this is your boy Isaac, and we are brothers on tennis. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks.